everybody. I'm going to actually get a bottle of water because there's bottles underneath here, but they're hand sanitizer. And I think that would be bad if I chose one of those. Um, hello, everybody. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Um, but I flew in yesterday, and I had to give a talk yesterday. Has anybody ever given a talk on an hour and a half of sleep? Um, this is not that talk, by the way. Um, but but the, the team at Red Hat asked me to give a quick talk about uh, my experience working with them uh, and, and our experience working with them, which has been an incredibly great partnership. I'm, I'm always happy to get on stage to, to talk about Red Hat and kind of what's going on with us. Um, but first of all, my name. I am, uh, my name is Jim Walker. I am Principal Product Evangelist at Cockroach Labs. I've been with the company for about three and a half years. Uh, and three and a half years ago, not many people knew what Cockroach Database was. In fact, they kind of thought it was gross and disgusting, whereas a lot of people now are kind of starting to use it. Um, three and a half years ago as well, over, I guess about five years ago, I started my journey in this whole Kubernetes space uh, at a company called CoreOS, which is actually now part of Red Hat. Um, and while I was at CoreOS, uh, Waleed, I don't know where you're at in the room, I met a lot of those same people. I love that slide with all the faces, dude. It's like my favorite slide of the entire day. Um, this conference is amazing because of those people and people that build communities. Uh, and, and I'm just I'm, I, I get so excited that I was part of that team that was at CoreOS at the beginning because, you know, KubeCon has been such a part of my life. And for the last two years, not having it has been odd uh, at best. And so, you know, uh, if it is your first time here, uh, I, will, I will second that. Go, go be the dance. You don't have to be the dancing guy. Just join in with the dancing guy because... Uh, this is just a wonderful community, and, and that's why I present today. So um, the, the, the premise of, of Cockroach and Red Hat and OpenShift and Kubernetes and this whole thing, you know, I, I try to simplify these things for salespeople all the time. Are there salespeople in the room? If you're a salesperson in the room, just if you could hold your, okay, we got one of them. All right, I'm going to disparage salespeople a little bit here on stage, but I, you guys, you, you're, you're good. You make money and commissions and all this stuff. Um, but I have to simplify things for salespeople sometimes, and sometimes we have to simplify things for our managers. Sometimes we have to simplify things for developers. And that's really what the theme of this conversation is, right? When I think about Kubernetes and what's going on in this modern world, it's really a, a combination of two things. We're dealing with scale and we're dealing with efficiency, right? The promise of scale is basically modern cloud infrastructure. The promise of efficiency is, oh my God, I have ubiquitous infrastructure. I better start automating all that because this is super inefficient because I need millions of resources to actually you know, handle all these things, right? And so when I talk about these things with my salespeople, I'm like, hey, man, look at, like, this is really what this stuff does. It allows us to actually deliver on some of these things. Oh, look, there's one of these things. Awesome. OK, great. Not going to work. Um, so how do you explain Kubernetes to people? So back at CoreOS, go back five years, I had to explain these things. So I took my slides that I used at our very first sales kickoff to explain what Kubernetes does to people. OK, there was a bunch of slides before this because, you know, salespeople didn't really understand what monolith to microservices meant. And, what a container was, and I had to actually kind of understand what a, I, God forbid, don't tell them what a namespace is, but you can actually break things down into what a container is, right? And you get to say, hey, look, at containers are these things that, you know, when we used to build software, I had a CD-ROM that was for Windows, and I had a CD-ROM for Mac, and I had all these different versions. We well, don't need that anymore. You just have kind of one version you just deploy everywhere, which is really cool. It's super portable and awesome, right? The entirety of this is predicated on that. Salespeople get that, right? But if I'm going to actually deploy these things and have them running on servers in these huge rooms with lots of things, I, who's controlling all that? What am I going to have, like 15 people logging into each machine or standing by each machine and managing all these things? That's all that Kubernetes does. That's it. It's really as simple as that. It automates all of this operations, right? And so if we start there, it's pretty simple. Now, what the Red Hat team is doing is saying, let's make it even more simple, right? Let's make it, let, let's package it so that there's UI. Let's package it so there's this whole like network of operators and things so like all these different pieces can come together, right? So it's really the next generation of simplification of Kubernetes. Now, back in the day when I, you know, the core OS days, uh, I struggled because, man, five years ago, managing Kubernetes was nothing short of, a, I, I don't know, was anybody, did anybody do it five years ago? It was nothing short of a nightmare. It was, it was pretty complex, pretty difficult, right? So we built something back then that was called Tectonic, right? A lot of what's in Tectonic was actually carried on into what's going on in OpenShift today, and a lot of those same engineers, right? And so it was really about simplifying these things and making it easier for the enterprise to adopt. Because, you know, look, at ultimately this thing does one thing, right? There's, there's two parts of Kubernetes. There's a control plane and these little pods. Anybody ever seen that movie Avengers, you know, where the big ship is up in the sky and then all these machines come down and wreak havoc on, 
on, uh, on Grand Central Station, that's Kubernetes, man. There's like the mothership, and then there's all these little guys. And if you kill the mothership, you're going to kill the whole thing, honest. Well, there's actually redundancies now for that. Okay, salespeople, it's pretty easy to understand, right? Like, I got it, Avengers. It's cool, right? Well, there's a state in this thing called Kubernetes in the control plane. It's called etcd. Etcd is just basically a database. That's how you got to think about it, right? Again, I'm talking to, to, to salespeople, right? It's just a database that has, like, state. I have these three different things that I want to do. I guess that's blue, red, and yellow, right? Uh, my colorblindness over the years has gotten worse, actually, I think. Right? And I have these three things I want to do. One of them is, like, get account. One of them is, like, print my statement. The third one is, you know, transfer funds to somebody, and it takes input. And I have all these different services. I have different levels of, 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 of like, of, of services that I need to fit the traffic for certain things. So what you do in Kubernetes, you basically just say, hey, look, at, I need 10 of the blue, and so it spins up 10 of those across these physical servers that are somewhere. That's all Kubernetes does. Look, at, I need eight of the red, and I need eight of the yellow. It's pretty simple. We get mired in all these kind of complex kind of considerations and descriptions of what Kubernetes is doing all the time. This, I hope, is one of the most simple explanations of what it is. I know probably people out there are going, wow, you just simplified like eight million things to make this work, right? But if I want to scale up one of those services because I have more demand, I just go into etcd, I go 10, great, I have services. It, it controls, the control plane says, this is the state that I need to be in. etcd is just managing state, right? OK, so but what if something fails, right? It understands that all these pods, one of my pods didn't check in. I better do something, so I better start moving some things around so that I'm going to maintain state. It's basically the ultimate like state guarantee. That's what Kubernetes is doing, y'all, OK? The simplest Kubernetes uh, presentation of the entire show, I presume, right? So what it did is it just moved a bunch of things around, right? It moved those three into some other servers, right? Pretty simple. OK, so I, I, I found Cockroach Database, like I said, about five years ago. And so I was at CoreOS, and the CEO of CoreOS, Alex Polvey, was going to get on stage and talk at uh, OpenStack Summit. And he's like, Jim, we need an application to show on this thing. And not, nobody was really building applications and things to actually work on top of Kubernetes, right? Back then, it was all like, it was stateless. It was ephemeral workloads. Like, what is this thing? I don't, I, what's, I don't even know what stateless means half the time. I'm an old developer. Everything has a database, right? Everything has state. I didn't, I didn't really kind of know where he was. Like, oh, talk to my friend Spencer at Cockroach. They're building a database that's kind of built for this whole thing, right? Like, it's kind of the same thing that's, you know, Google did with Spanner that they were doing on Borg. Well, this is like, this is like that, but for Kubernetes, right? It's going to be pretty cool. I'm like, great. Go check it out. Um, databases, I learned very quickly, have some pretty interesting challenges when it comes to Kubernetes. Um, if you just try to spin up an instance of Postgres, sure, I could spin it up in a single pod. I could connect to that thing. Okay, it's pretty interesting. Okay, well, once we got, you know, um, uh, uh, stateful sets, we were actually maintained persistent volumes underneath that thing so that the storage just didn't go away, right? Because the ephemeral nature of pods, like, it helped a whole lot of things in this world, right? We used to use daemon sets to do that. Right? But stateful sets, it was about three and a half, four years ago, really helped the community kind of maintain state within what was going inside a pod. Now, that lit up a bunch of databases, right? Because state is very important to a database. Because all a database is, is a layer between somebody that's trying to do something and some storage somewhere. That is literally all it is. It's a language that allows people to store data to disk. That's it. And if I lose the disk, which is attached to a pod, well, I've, I've actually invalidated the point of a database. Now, databases in Kubernetes are really difficult because you can bring up a single instance of a database and run it in a pod, and great, I have this like instance, and I can maybe scale that up. Well, just I, what's my scale? I'm going to get as big as that, that pod, right? Like, I'm, basically, it's vertical scale at some point. Or I could try to run into these, one of these things in these kind of distributed natures, um, but the case, that gets really complex as well because not all databases, at least on the relation side, were built to be distributed. They weren't built for scale. They weren't built to, you know, this, this failover thing. Like, if I just want to increase the state of this service, how do I increase this? How do I get more instances, right? Cockroach was basically just built for that whole world. And when I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Because the challenges that we have around efficiency that we're addressing with things like Kubernetes, get, they get accelerated. They, they go exponential when you start dealing with databases because now you're dealing with actual physical storage and basically, you know, the data that's in your app, which is probably one of the most important things that the developer con is concerned about. Right? And so there's lots of different challenges. And so like, being cloud-native in this context is actually pretty important. So when we talk about cloud-native databases, you know, like, like the Vitesse project is cloud-native. It's extremely interesting to me. Right? What we're doing at Cockroach is cloud-native. It's extremely interesting to me. When we attach that word cloud-native to something, it actually means something, y'all. 
It doesn't mean that I have an operator and I could run that thing in a pod and I could manage this thing and all this stuff. No, it's the way the thing works is what's important. It's inside, the architecture of that, that solution. I don't care if it's a database or a CRM or something in between. If it's cloud native, it means something. It means it's built to scale and it's built to be resilient. It's that core kind of description of what I said when I said Kubernetes and what that is, right? And so to me, when I look at cloud native, it, it's, those are the things that are really important, especially at the application layer, you know, above all this kind of craziness that we deal with. So, when you look at databases, uh, I, again, I'm a shill for CockroachDB. When I look at databases, I think of the relational database. I never coded in a NoSQL database. I'm sorry, I left the document model somewhere around XML. I never really understood it. Um, I guess I was just built in a world of you know, relational data models and referential integrity and normalization and these sort of things. Um, but you know, these databases are really cool. I get to build things really quickly. They're dynamic. They're, they're, they allow us to do some things like the availability, the resilience, sound familiar, right? No SQL databases. But the power of the relational database is still needed by our mission critical apps, right? Are you gonna run like a, you know, a, a financial ledger on a, on a, on a no SQL database? You're not gonna do that because you're not gonna get guaranteed consistent transactions, right? We still need the relational database because honestly, it is basically the back end of all of our mission critical data in, in organizations. However, it wasn't built to be distributed. It wasn't built to be cloud native, right? So if we could take all those things uh, and make it distributed, make it elastic, make it automated, make it modern, right, for what we're trying to do, that's great. Well, a lot of them try to do that, but you're gonna, you're gonna need these complex operators to actually do those things, right? Operator is just basically a synthesis of something that you all would have to do, but automated into a script. I think when we first named operators, we we're gonna call them controller operators. I think Brandon Phillips wanted to call them controllers and then Rob Zumski is on the OpenShift team, he's a product manager, Rob's awesome. He wanted to call them controller operators and we ended up calling them operators because ultimately that is that's all they're doing. They aren't controlling, they're doing your operations for you and you need these complex things to actually make these things work in these complex environments for most of the databases. So Cockroach combines all these things. I think you know where I was headed uh, in this whole thing. And so how do we do that? First of all, this is a relational database. Um, so like I said, referential integrity, secondary indexes, all the kinds of worlds of inner and outer joins and all the things you wanna do, uh, materialized views, everything you would expect out of Postgres, right? Wire compatible with Postgres, the same sort of things you would wanna do in that environment. Hey Jim, what about stored procedures? Well, do you wanna do stored procedures in a distributed environment? I love asking this in a, in a crowd where people get, under, get distributed systems in Kubernetes because it's a little bit more straightforward. Does it make sense? Or would you just basically take store procedures and re-architect that as a microservice and have it controlled by the control plane in Kubernetes? Doesn't that make sense? For us, we feel store procedures are an anti-pattern. Will we implement it? Eventually. I think we'll call it distributed data functions, though. Let's actually make it something that's valuable. Let's not take a legacy past and just basically fork it over and live in this new world. And that's what I mean by cloud native. Rethinking how you actually build in the application itself, not just the infrastructure, what we're all dealing with is service meshes and API discoveries and Kubernetes, like literally, there's a lot more, there's another layer that developers really struggle with. And as ISVs, it's on us to basically make sure that this stuff is cloud native. Because this is what's gonna light up everything that we're all working on, right? So, but make it familiar, it should be relational. Scale on Cockroach is pretty easy, spin up a node, point it at the cluster, and you have both horizontal and vertical scale. Uh, vertical, you just have more computation, horizontal. You don't have to do any sort of manual sharding in your application, which is an absolute nightmare. Um, but we can scale beyond just, say, a single data center, or in this case, can you scale a database? Can you have a single logical database that spans across multiple Kubernetes clusters? When I saw this, I actually could, this, this, is, this is the next thing I couldn't unsee. Deploying a database in a single cluster is fairly straightforward, right? Like, I, I, I just talked about these things. What if I want a single logical database that's actually spanning multiple different regions because I have different Kubernetes clusters across you know, the United States at three different spots? So that any node in, say, US East can actually access any of the data that's in US West or in the Philippines or in Europe or wherever you want to be. Right? So being able to do that, being able to scale beyond just a single data center into what you really want to do, can I federate at the data layer as opposed to federating all the clusters? I love what's going on. Well, SigFed used to be like this really interesting space it's really difficult to federate clusters. What if we move that up at the database layer? And let's logically do it there. And that's exactly what this is doing. Uh, we can survive the failure of an entire region. When we write data cockroach, we don't actually synchronize data. We, we have distributed consensus. 
If you're not familiar with what Raft is as a distributed consensus algorithm, go check it out. There's a website called thesecretlivesofdata.com, which is just fantastic to, to help you understand what Raft is. Um, but we could do some other special things. We can tie data to regions, right? So if you have data living in different clusters, do you want it always kind of moving between these clusters? No. Can the database control and tie data to a, a, an explicit location? It's kind of one of the magic things that we do in, uh, in CockroachDB. So that's the overview of kind of what we do. Um, but over the past couple months, and really over the past three years, I guess, I think when I started at Cockroach, we started working with Red Hat and lots of different stuff. Because I think we share a similar vision of what this hybrid world looks like, right? What does this look like when I have clusters? I don't care if they're across cloud providers or on-prem, whatever. That's hybrid to me. That's multi-cloud. And the two companies really share a vision of what I believe is a pragmatic reality, is that these things are not going to live in one spot. And so when I think about like, like partnering with companies and, and things working or not, it really starts with a shared vision. And I think you know, working with the Red Hat team, it's been incredible. And so over the last, oh gosh, it's been about a year, I think, the Red Hat team's been working on, or about six months, a year, I think, right? Um, they've been working on Red Hat OpenShift database access, which is Rhoda. Anybody who grew up in the 70s, Rhoda just makes me laugh every single time. I don't know why. Um, you, you know what it is if you know. Um, but it's really about this, this, remember this simplification journey I was talking about? Like, let's take, you know, started way back in my world in Tectonic, and then was OpenShift, and like, how do we make these things really, really easy? Well, deploying a database is really difficult in Kubernetes. So how do I get this kind of push button access to a database from OpenShift and from the OpenShift UI? And that's, it's really as simple as that. Let's, let's forget about all these things. Well, it works really well with us because we're a cloud native database. It works well with some other databases too because, well, they, they have those aspects but they also have operators that are, you know, Red Hat, you know, operator certified. Red Hat OpenShift operator certified. There's a lot of words sometimes, right? And so the Red Hat team does the work to actually make sure these things are going to work, and then simplifying it for everybody. So they wrote a really good blog post that talks about this. You could use the QR code if you want to go check out exactly what they're building. But really, it's kind of a, a, a really a management plane for databases within Red Hat OpenShift. That's the way I think about it. Um, and it, it's pretty simple, straightforward. Like, we're really happy because, well, we, we develop, we deploy pretty easy. It's, it's kind of like I said, it's push button and you're kind of ready to deploy. Um, and then it's in preview right now. Uh, that's the second QR code actually goes into the docs if you want to go check that out. Um, and so there, there's a little bit more information there. So that's what I wanted to talk about, a little bit about, you know, simplifying Kubernetes the way we talk about it, a little bit about databases and a little bit about our partnership. Um, but I have one last thing. You can go start a cluster of cockroach right now. First of all, that's me. I'm on Twitter as James. That's me everywhere. Um, but I'll also give you this. This is like my one last thing. Uh, we published our first uh, O'Reilly definitive guide. And God, I was really happy that they gave us a cockroach. Because if it was like a lemur or something, that would be really weird. Um, but we got a cockroach on it. So if you want to go check out and get a free book, uh, if you want to build out your O'Reilly library, you see, that's when the phones come up with QR codes, everybody. Free books. Um, go check it out and, and try Cockroach today. So that is what I had. So thank you, everybody.